Our second lecture on uh, antibacterial drugs is going to specifically be looking at um, drugs which target protein synthesis. So we're going to explain how bacterial protein synthesis can be targeted and what the consequences are. Uh, in particular, we're going to describe the mechanisms of action of four different classes of uh, antibacterial drug, the amphenicols, the macrolides, the tetracyclines and the aminoglycosides. We're also going, to, also going to discuss their pharmacokinetics and side effects and also their clinical uses. So just to remind ourselves again what protein translation looks like, this was covered in the molecular lecture 3 and in particular the coming together of the ribosomes with the messenger RNA. The RNA is read in sequences of three known as codons and these codons are paired with anticodons from transfer RNA molecules and these transfer RNA molecules carry specific amino acids which then are added to a growing polypeptide chain in the creation of a new protein. Um, there's three main positions on the ribosome. The A site where the tRNA arrives with the specific amino acid, the P site where it's processed and where it's chemically bonded via peptide bond uh, to the neighbouring amino acid and then the E, the exit site where it leaves uh, once it's finished transferring the uh, amino acid. Um, so this uh, appears uh, to be quite similar to um, eukaryotic or human cells, however there are some subtle differences which allow us to uh, target this particular process. So these differences include a difference in the overall structure of the ribosomes. The eukaryotic ribosome contains a 60S and a 40S subunit to give an 80S complete ribosome and they're combined whereas the bacterial ribosome consists of a 50S and a 30S uh, combining to give a 70S complete ribosome. Um, the bacterial translation process uh, must commence with the binding of mRNA to the 30S subun uh, subunit and then the 50S. Um, so this is something that is um, similar but slightly different to the eukaryotic cell. Um, so during this particular lecture, we're going to be discussing four families of, uh, four, four classes of, of uh, anti antibacterial drug which target protein synthesis. Um, the first of these is called the amphenicols, and shown in the diagram is the uh, ribosome and the the process of protein synthesis, and in addition and in addition to that, where each of these classes target. So for the amphenicols. Um, the affenicols would, uh, would uh, target the 50S portion of the ribosome and inhibit formation of the peptide bond. So this is highlighted in the diagram. A specific example of the amphenicols is a chloramphenicol. So as we said, the mechanism of action of the amphenicols is to inhibit protein synthesis by binding to the 50S, the larger subunit, and to inhibit the formation of the peptide bond. These are broad-spectrum antibiotics, and they're also bacteriostatic in nature um, for most organisms, but they can kill a Haemophilus uh, influenza. The diagram at the bottom shows how antibiotics can be broken up according to their spectrum, their route of administration, and their type of activity. So some of these antibiotics have a broad spectrum, meaning that they can target a number of different bacterial cells, whereas others have a more narrow spectrum and may only perhaps target certain types of gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria. Uh, many uh, uh, antibiotics are bactericidal, some are bacteriostatic, meaning that they can either kill the bacteria or stop its growth. Uh, and finally, the route of administration is also important as uh, some can be injectable and some can be taken orally via tablets. Uh, resistance for the uh, phenicols is mediated by uh, plasma transfer. So going back to lecture one, where we said that uh, these plasmids can be transferred by conjugation from one bacterium to another, and they often carry resistance genes to specific um, anti antibacterial drugs. Uh, so chloramphenicol resistance um, is mediated by the coding of an enzyme called chloramphenicol acetyltransferase, which is able to uh, modify and disable the chloramphenicol. So in terms of administration, it's given orally and it's rapidly and completely absorbed, uh, reaching its maximum um, plasma concentration within two hours, as uh, 
just a reminder of what plasma um, Cmax is by the diagram on the top right. It's widely distributed throughout the tissues and fluids and including the cerebral spinal fluid. It's excreted in the urine with 10% of it remaining unchanged and metabolized in the liver. The side effects include gastrointestinal disturbances and hypersensitivity reactions. A rare side effect with um, the amphenicols is something called pancytopenia, where there is a decrease in the number of all blood cell types. However, uh, this is quite rare. Uh, for those individuals, their blood cells would have to be monitored. So just to maybe discuss for a moment why a lot of these side effects are, are appearing again and again with antibiotics, why would uh, gastrointestinal disturbances be so common in taking uh, antibiotics? Well, just the diagram on the left-hand side shows a normal bacterial cell population that are resident in the gut, and you can see the epithelial cells on the bottom in, in green, and these secrete a layer of mucus which protect us from the invasion of pathogens. But in addition to that, our microbiota also prevent the invasion uh, by pathogenic bacteria. So we kind of need them there to help us out. When antibiotics are taken, uh, particularly oral antibiotics, they kill these uh, normal and healthy microbiota, therefore giving a selective advantage to the pathogenic bacteria, meaning they can overgrow in that particular region of the gut, which can be dangerous. Therefore, it's not unusual for people to experience uh, side effects, gastrointestinal side effects, during a course of, of oral antibiotics. The second major side effect, which I've, I've mentioned a number of times in previous examples, is hypersensitivity reactions. And this can um, occur where either the parent drug itself, the anti antibacterial drug, or a metabolite combines with a native protein, so a protein that's normally present in the cell. Um, when this happens, the combination of the native protein with the, uh, the antibacterial drug or its metabolite causes a change in the shape or the native protein now looks different to our body's immune system. Very often this can um, give a signal in some individuals that our bodies might be under attack by a foreign particle. Um, our bodies will develop an immune response to it, that means uh, B cells developing antibodies, uh, T cells emerging as well, and in particular killer, killer T cells in some cases, and targeting cells that have this combination of the uh, antibacterial drug and the um, native protein. Um, so this leads to all sorts of hypersensitivity or allergic reactions. In some inv individuals this can lead to anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, where the uh, cytokine and immune response is so overwhelming that they lose blood pressure and uh, they, they often die as a result. The clinical uses of chloramphenicol in particular um, are, are serious, so the, the, the effects are serious, so the, they should be reserved for serious infections as the side effects can be serious as we've, we've just noted, the pancytopenia. So this hematological toxicity can be quite risky obviously. Um, they can in particular be used for uh, resistant Haemophilus influenza infections as they do kill this particular bacteria and also in meningitis where patients can't take penicillin. They can be given safely um, to some external organs such as the eye, so for conjunctivitis they can be safe when given top topically um, as indicated by the, the diagram on the right showing the eye drops. The second family that we're going to mention here are the macrolides and a uh, a major member of this is the this family or the is the erythromycin. This also binds to the 50s portion, but rather than preventing the formation of peptide bonds, it actually uh, prevents the translocation movement of the ribosome along the messenger RNA. So, if you remember, when we were doing translation, we said that the ribosome needs to move along the messenger RNA molecule in order to read each of the separate codons. However, macrolides work by inhibiting this movement and stop the translocation of the uh, ribosome along the mRNA molecule. So therefore, the, the, the ribosome can no longer make protein. So the macrolides and erythromycin being an example shown on the right, have this unique lactone ring structure. So this is what we see in the middle of the erythromycin molecule there on the right hand side of the slide. They inhibit protein synthesis by binding to the 50S subunit, by preventing translocation movement of the ribosome along the mRNA molecule. Uh, 
We've mentioned already erythromycin being an example. Uh, others include clarithromycin and azithromycin. These tend to be broad-spectrum antibiotics. Um, erythromycin is a safe alternative to penicillin-sensitive uh, patients, and resistance can occur from a plasmid-controlled alteration in the binding site for erythromycin on the uh, ribosome. Uh, so yet another, another example of resistance developing to a particular uh, antibacterial drug. Erythromycin is effective against both gram-positive, uh, sorry, against gram-positive but not uh, gram-negative bacteria. In terms of its pharmacokinetics, you can see by the diagram on the right that they can be given as tablets, so they are administered orally. They distribute to most tissues but do not cross the blood brain barrier. This may be advantageous in some cases but not in others. Um, and they penetrate the synovial joints poorly. They can often accumulate in phagocytic cells in the of the immune system and can get eliminated by the bile. The erythromycin is partly inactivated in the liver. Um, azithromycin is resistant to an activation and clarithromycin is converted to an active metabolite. So for three of the different members, they have uh, different uh, types of, of metabolic um, uh, reactions. <coughs> Their inhibition of P450 enzymes can affect the bioavailability of some other drugs. So this is something we'll discuss in detail another time. Um, side effects again include gastrointestinal disturbances and hypersensitivity reactions, but also some opportunistic infections too. The third family we're going to discuss are the, um, the tetracyclines and the main example um, used here is tet a, a compound called tetracycline, and this works by interfering with the attachment of the transfer RNA molecule to mRNA ribosome complex. So tetracyclines, as the name suggests, contains four um, cycling um, rings, so tetra meaning four, and this is obviously uh, visible in the diagram on the right of tetracycline. They get taken up by active transport and they inhibit um, protein synthesis by interfering with the attachment of the transfer RNA molecule to the mRNA and ribosome. They are bacteriostatic but not bacteriocidal and examples include tetracycline as shown in the diagram but also doxy doxycycline and minocycline which are molecules used for other indications also. In terms of their pharmacokinetics they can be given orally um, uh, but can be given parenterally as well. <coughs> their absorption varies but is improved in the absence of food so this is a uh, this is something which is often seen whereby food can actually interfere with the absorption of certain chemicals um, another noticeable uh, feature about tetracyclines is that they can chelate metal ions such as calcium and magnesium forming complexes um, their absorption is decreased as a result in the presence of milk and with antacids. Um, so this is definitely a case whereby food and or uh, the consumption of milk can affect the absorption of this particular tetracycline. So this may be indicated on the uh, instructions with this particular antibiotic. Again, GI disturbances due to the loss of microbiota. Um, and because of its ability to chelate metal ions, it can actually deposit in growing bones and teeth, and in some case, cases lead to bone and teeth deformities. Clinically, its, uh, its use has declined due to widespread resistance. It tended to be broad spectrum, used against uh, gram positive and gram negative uh, bacteria, and against also some mycoplasma, uh, protozoa, and larger multicellular organisms. Um, Often also it was used for respiratory tract infections, uh, chronic bron bronchitis in particular, um, and often used as an alternative to, uh, for patients with uh, allergies. Our last and fourth member of the uh, protein synthesis inhibitors include the aminoglycosides, of which streptomycin is a member. And this affects the 30S ribosome, changing its shape and causing, on, causing codes codons on mRNA to be read incorrectly, as indicated by the diagram. So the aminoglycosides change the shape of the 30S subunit, causing an abnormal anticodon-codon interaction and a misreading of the mRNA. So this is shown on the diagram on the right, whereby 
um, the wrong amino acid is actually added to the growing polypeptide chain, meaning the proteins aren't assembled or made correctly due to the amino glycoside changing the way in which the uh, 30th subunit is uh, interacting. Its effect is bactericidal. Uh, the crossing of these molecules of the bacterial cell membrane depends on active transport and resistance can be due to degradation by microbial enzyme or blocking cell entry. Its function is enhanced by the use of uh, beta-lactam antibiotics too. It's effective against a wide range of aerobic and uh, gram-positive, uh, gram-negative and some gram-positive uh, bacteria, but it has low uh, activity with anaerobes. Examples include gentamicin, neomycin, and we've already mentioned streptomycin. In terms of its pharmacokinetics and clinical uses, the aminoglycosides are generally cations and highly polar, so they are not absorbed well by the gastrointestinal tract. Um, therefore, they have to be administered very often parenterally. They can be given intramuscularly or IV. Um, they cross the placenta, but not the blood-brain barrier. Their elimination is by the kidney um, via glomerular filtration, with 50% of the molecule remaining unchanged. Their side effects are dose-dependent and can often include nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity, which affects the ear. These, in these cases, the serum levels should be monitored. Ototoxicity arises as a result of destruction of the sensory cells in the, co- in the cochlea and results in vertigo or loss of balance, whereas the nephrotoxicity is manifested by damage to the nephron tubular cells and can prevent its own excretion. Um, this leads to accumulation and can cause even further damage. Clinically, it's used in uh, with infections by gram-negative bacteria, such as uh, E. coli, for example. So in summary, today we discussed four different classes of uh, antibiotics targeting protein synthesis. And these all work by slightly different mechanisms by interfering with interactions at different positions between the ribosome and the messenger RNA and and transfer RNA molecules.